John Clark, who's the VP of Digital Distribution at Sega, very much a traditional publisher. He's going to be talking about how a traditional publisher can make the connection between content and consumer. John. Thank you, Charles. Hello, everybody. Um, that's me. My name's John Clark, and I'm the VP of Digital at Sega. Um, what my team looks at at Sega is all of our PC digital download business, console download business, cloud, um, new business developments, and currently looking at games as a service technologies and how we roll them out across, across the group. And I'm talking, as Charles says, about connecting to the consumer. Um, when we when we obviously look at games, we know there are millions of gamers out there, and, um, and every game does need to find its audience, and we all know that discovery can be a challenge. Hopefully in my presentation, which will revolve around PC gaming in general, um, we all share the same challenge, which is that route to the consumer, and really getting the consumer to have some sort of buy-in to the game and the content that we've got. From a point of view of Sega, we are massively massively in an envious position. We work with fantastic developers such as um, Relic, Sports Interactive, and Creative Assembly, all of which produce some incredible PC franchises. And it actually drives us on. Their innovation and their creative skills drive us on to be a much more sort of valuable partner for them. We've you know, reference publishing quite a lot. It doesn't matter if you're an independent or a big AAA studio. If you can't publish a game, you can't reach the consumer. And we've worked very hard over the last sort of three or four years to ensure that we innovate within a publishing space and ensure that the great content we have, we offer value to that to make sure that it can reach its pot potential maximum audience. Digital has changed everything. It enables our studios to think about publishing, and it enables us to think about publishing in different ways. And the big thing about digital is our mindset. And we no longer think of shipping out one million units of a game. More so, we think of one consumer engagement and one quality consumer engagement one million times. And we're just turning it on our head so, just so we can think about it in a different way. Fortunately, within our organization, Sega have innovated over the years, whether it's with the hardware, software, or more recently with corporate structures, which is vital how we go forward. And we need to continue to innovate. And Sega gives us the flexibility to think slightly differently to a lot of our peers. And most importantly, it's not about you know, whether you're a traditional publisher or not. It's about whether you're traditionally publishing, if that makes sense. You know, so we need to do things differently. We need to stay ahead of the curve. Publishing is no longer exclusive to companies like Sega. It's for everybody to do. So we need to maintain quality and innovation. Taking all of those key words and just putting it together, we see our role as no longer just selling games. We see it as making consumer connections and ensure that there's a clean channel to the consumer. We work on growing our audience, assessing every possible channel to the consumer, whether it's at traditional retail or whether it's digitally. Wherever there's a consumer that wants to make a content interaction, we need to extend to that audience. And we really need to think flexibly. And of course, continue to maintain relevance. Just quickly talking about how we see ourselves as a publisher, and we've got the four strands there that we feel we bring to the table. So whether it's assembling talent, financing projects, distributing and marketing content, or adding a commercial focus to, to everything, you know, that really is the role of publishing within, uh, within the video games. My area generally concentrates on the distribution of content, and in particular, what the team that I work with does is monetize and distribute or sells content. And within that, we can see that it includes free-to-play, it includes download-to-own, it also includes content marketing. Now, what this means to us is how we get standout. We don't just want to put games on sale, we want to add features. We want to give better reasons to get games to stand out to the audience. Our team also works with our tech partnerships and developments. So whether it's looking at Steam machines, cloud, uh, virtual reality headsets with, with Oculus, um, you know, it's important that we stay close to what's happening out there with the tech world. And lastly, we have our developer relations um, people sitting within our team. 
Um, we like to look at what's going on, what indies are getting up to, because that's where the innovation happens, at the developer side. So if we can look at what content's being de developed, we can start to think about partnerships, we can start to think about games that we think would be successful going forward. And it all aids the way we think about publishing and the discovery. Ultimately, and I think this has been mentioned before, we do see the gap between the creator or the developer and the consumer being a direct relationship. We don't see ourselves as publishers being in the way of things or owning a particular channel. And what we can do to try and make sure that consumers can reach the creators is, is, is our vision. It's what we sort of strive to achieve at the moment. We want to expand that customer base. There's addressable markets. You know, we need to identify who they are and put them in touch with the content, put them in touch with the content creator, and make sure that there's a seamless delivery of the content. But more than that now, the consumer is not somebody who has a one-way relationship or even a relationship of blogging and posting comments. The consumers are now becoming collaborators or creators themselves. And I think, you know, whether it's through Kickstarter or Team Fortress 2 or modding or YouTube, you know, we see people creating content and we think that's vital that we have that ongoing relationship and just looking at the consumer as far more than just a customer. I'm going to move on to a couple of examples now because thinking like that means that we, we need to sell our games, you know, we need to get stand out, we need to reach that connection with the consumer. And I think you know, if, we, if we look at Steam, and in 2012, 380 games were, were released, new re games were released on Steam. Um, last year, 600, over 600 games were released. And I know that any of you that have released a game on Steam will know that to get sort of quality standout and discovery is quite a challenge. And it's exactly the same for us with you know, franchises such as Company Heroes, Total War and Football Manager. We have exactly the same challenges. More games are being launched more quickly, and I think with developers now setting their own pricing, we're going to see some interesting developments. We don't believe that cutting the price in games is the way to, to grow our business. We support Steam sales, and we think they're fantastic, but we also look to add features and add quality to the content. As we say, that hopefully will drive our uh, standout and discovery. I'm now going to talk through three examples of things that we think we've done differently that aids that discovery and aids that co connection to the consumer. And I'm going to start with a recent promotion that we did, which is called Make War, Not Love. It was ran across a Valentine's Day weekend. And the idea here was not, not just putting two games head to head, which was Company of Heroes 2 and Rome 2, and they both went on sale for this weekend, but we wanted to make something a little bit more of it. And we even put the developers head to head as well. So the two games head to head, the developers head to head, and then finally the communities of the games head to head, which just lifted the whole sort of um, uh, relevance of the promotion. Just talking through what we did, we started off with the studios, both Creative Assembly and Relic, engaged in some sort of baiting of each other, some social jousting on the networks, both trying to challenge each other on who was the best studio out of the two of them. And they had an online game of um, Counter-Strike, which was uh, publicized by, by Twitch TV and social media channels. And Relic won the game of Counter-Strike and proclaimed themselves the better studio. However, the studio said, well, it's not really down to us. Let's let our communities decide. We think the Rome 2 community is much better than the Company of Heroes 2 community. So they set a competition. And the competition was Make War, Not Love. And the idea was that whichever community had the most victories in their game that weekend, they would be the winner. They would be the best game, the best community, the best studio. And at the end of the weekend, all the victories were, were recorded live on a Make War Not Love website. And at the end of the weekend, the winning community won some free DLC for the entire game user base. Now, this was fantastic for us. It was something we'd never done before. And we generated 45 news stories, which started out of Facebook um, with Relic and, C, uh, and, and CA really getting involved with each other, with people who we didn't know saying it was a great promotion. It's good to see the studios get on so well. We had 200,000 uniques on our own website that we set up for the promotion of Make War Not Love, of people just checking what the, what the live score was. And uh, again, we had Miles, the, the head of Sports Interactive, even got involved on Twitter and mentioned it. But we just had some great coverage. We acquired new users, and we acquired lapsed, reacquired lapsed users as well. And that's sort of vital in a promotion such as this. 
And of course, data is very important, and we are able to track a lot of our customer behavior through using Google Analytics, but also other data that we, that we use within the game and within Steam. So that was one promotion. We felt that we engaged various areas of the community through content and developer. The next example I'm going to use is of a, a slightly different game where we decided to um, seed awareness out to the community prior to sending out a press release to traditional media channels. Um, this was our tease on October the 29th. It was this year. Guts will be something. Guts will be something. And it was Guts Will Be Spelled, and it was Typing of the Dead. And we decided that Typing of the Dead Overkill, we would launch without put it going out there with a press release. We felt that this being a, a retro game, um, we probably wouldn't have got an 85% review or lots of coverage. But we felt that the consumers would enjoy it, so we went straight to them first. For those of you who aren't familiar with Typing of the Dead, it's a zombie-themed typing tutor. It's a little bit riskier than uh, Mavis Beacon, and you don't shoot the zombies, you have to type uh, various words or phrases to make sure that, that you stop, uh, stop them from killing you. So, you know, how did it work? It was, it was a resounding success. We think we, within about the first three hours of going live with, with the Guts Will Be Spelled page, we had something like 1,000 uh, tweets, all being positive, all from the community. And we went top five on Steam instantly. And it was, as I say, it was a resounding success for us. And we experimented with, with something new in terms of seeking PR for the game. We got some mainstream coverage as well. Uh, because shortly after launching the game, we then put out the, the traditional press release. And Kotaku um, pointed out that we forgot to tell anybody we were releasing this game. Well, in fact, we, we didn't forget. We just didn't tell you. We wanted to tell the community first. And although they say it's an awesome new PC game. We don't know if they'd have said it was awesome if we'd have gone straight to them first. So by the time they wrote this article, there were a 1,000 tweets saying the game was awesome. So we think the job was pretty much done. Along the way, though, in terms of connecting, I mean, the, the, the game was being developed by Blitz Studios, which unfortunately went into administration um, some way through the project. And eager to get the game finished, we worked with a team at Blitz to complete the game. And that, that, that team went on to become Modern Dream. And I think Ollie Clark's here now. So that, again, was a fantastic story. To work through that situation made us learn, learn a lot as well. And with everything, we released DLC. DLC is really important to us. It keeps us connected to the consumer. It keeps the consumer playing. It retains. It brings new users. It gives us another reason for a promotion. And Modern Dream, you know, we still work with Modern Dream to ensure that we bring out different dictionary packs. And we now get PR every time we release a dictionary pack. And, you know, that's, it's just fantastic to have that support. Here we have a movie quote pack. Here we have a sing-along pack. Something for Valentine's Day. And as we're in the Northeast, this one was inspired by... Um, Viz and Roger Melly's Profanosaurus. We felt that, you know, an 18 certificate filth dictionary um, could have been what the consumers wanted. I don't know if we'd have got all this coverage if we hadn't gone straight to the consumer first and let the, let, you know, and really connecting with the consumer. And finally, the last example that I think of is a partnership with, with the Yogs cast. Um, we're big fans of the Yogs cast, and we wondered if there was anything we could do for charity together. And we've got a game called Sonic All-Stars Racing Transformed, a character-based racing with Sonic and all of his friends in there. It's available on PC. We developed and released lots of, uh, lots of DLC for it. And the idea was we put Simon, the guy in the middle, um, would be launched as DLC within the game. So he was created, it was pushed by Yogscast, we ran a promotion on Steam for the main game, and all the proceeds for the DLC went to special effect. And you know, we were able to connect with the consumer through various channels, whether it was through charity channels, Yogscast channels, um, Sega channels, Sonic channels, to drive you know, great awareness, but also lots of um, you know, revenues for the charity. And there's Simon in his boat, and there's Simon in his plane. And there he is winning. And he won almost £30,000 for, for a special effect, which we think was absolutely fantastic. So to summarize, I think I'm doing okay for time. Um, but to summarize the, you know, the areas that we look at, connecting to the consumer means that we still believe and we want to push that the relationship from the consumer to the creator is really, really important. Digital 
makes, makes the uh, developer so accessible. We think that the consumer is now becoming the creator, the collaborator. And again, we need to support that and ensure whether it's through Steam Workshop or other channels such as modding, you know, we need to support that interaction. We feel that the community drives valuable awareness. The work that the com there's no way we could have got a thousand news stories out in three hours. Um, you know, so the community is vital for us in that. And we look at content as marketing. You know, any, anybody who's ever worked with a, a traditional retailer will tell you about the cost you would pay for a gondola end at game or a windowing game. We just reinvest sort of similar, if not less, amounts of money in creating DLC packs. If we don't make any money on the DLC, that's fine because we'll make money on the overall franchise. So we see the investment in DLC more as, more as marketing assets than as, than as game content. And, you know, one of the most important things that any traditional publisher needs to do is make sure that the environment is flexible, that all of the staff, all of the publishing staff, the development staff can really, really think with a bit of freedom and aren't bogged down and, and, and kept back by inane processes that have existed for about 20 years. And that is it. Short and sweet, hopefully.